Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, everyone. This is day three of Aussie Live 2015. With great pleasure, we are putting on a keynote today with Ian Murray at the helm of a team of Toastmasters from across the globe. I'll show you the span of our time zones in just a moment. We're going to be talking about leadership in the 21st century. It's a topic close to our hearts, all of us as educators, and especially to Toastmasters. Thank you to our audience for joining us. We may find that others will pop in and out as we go through our one hour together. Yes, we started the recording. We always want to say thank you to our sponsors and supporters for Aussie Live 2015. And for the benefit of our new presenters today, this is part of the projects of the Australia E-Series. We're a bunch of educators, mainly in Australia, across all states, who come together to provide free educational webinars for teachers in all fields of education, primary school, secondary, tertiary, and community. The other really great thing about our Aussie Live 2015 is we haven't had to pay for the rooms at all. That would have cost an arm and a leg. So we can do it free of charge for our guests. And this is all thanks to the Learning Revolution Project, headed up by our patron, Steve Harkadon. Thank you, Joe, for mentioning his name there. And of course, thank you to Blackboard Collaborate themselves for allowing us to use the rooms. So here's the span of our guests today, and you'll see some of us in the videos at the top. And as each person speaks, their picture will become larger in that video viewing panel, like Greg right now. And if you like, you can make that little video panel larger. There's a tiny little icon in the top right corner of that panel which is the options menu, and you can drag, you can say, first of all, detach panel, and then you can make it a little larger if you need to. You can pop it back by clicking on the cross at the top. We are about to start our session called Leadership in the 21st Century, and I welcome to the lectern now, Ian Murray. Leadership in the 21st Century. Thank you very much, Carol, for that really good introduction, and you've covered almost all the bases I can possibly think of. So well done on covering our sponsors and welcoming our guests that are, are listening today or even when they see the recording down the track. Today will be an interesting session. We are running this keynote as, as a discussion, and we will have four panellists, five panellists now, who will be participating in the discussion at the, the front of the room, but will actually encourage all of our attendees to participate in some way through the session. And I'll just remind people that given we are running a panel, there will be often several microphones um, perhaps taking some noise. So try to keep on mute as much as we can so that we can keep our conversation flowing smoothly and clearly for all of our guests. In holding a session around leadership in the 21st century, it's really important, I think, to realise that we are already almost 20% of the way through the 21st century. We're actually quite advanced in that journey. And one of the organisations around the world that's working on leadership skill development, particularly for the adult education market, but also reaching out to a number of schools to leadership programs in schools, to public speaking programs in schools, is Toastmasters International. And we actually have the tagline these days, where leaders are made. And given we were talking about leadership in the 21st century, it seemed appropriate for me to organise a group of Toastmasters to come together and speak about what Toastmasters is doing around leadership, but also what are the general challenges around leadership in the places that we all live, work and play. Uh, all of us have circles of influence where, where leadership skills come to the fore, 
whether it's in large organisations, small organisations, or even in self-leadership, the world has changed. And today, I'd love to explore some of those things with, with all of you. What are the challenges of leadership and, and what do we need to do about them to, to move us all forward? I mentioned that we're Toastmasters and Toastmasters is a very big organisation. As you'll see from the map there, a bit like the map before, we have Toastmasters scattered all over the world these days. There are some, some 350,000 Toastmasters rounding across the world at the moment who are all going through our leadership and public speaking training programs. It's a significant number of people spread very widely but also with a wide level of experience. And you'll see some of those experiences today from, from our panellists. We have people who are brand new, never having spoken in public before, to people who have been in Toastmasters for perhaps 50 years. We have that huge range of experience and we are, we are growing all the time. In fact, much of the growth is in the Asian, Asian region and there's more and more happening in that space. Now, we've already marked where most of our visitors are on our map, so I think we'll just move on to introducing our, our four, now five, speakers in the, in the spotlight. Now, I wasn't quite sure that I told my fellow panellists that we were going to be in the spotlight that like that slide shows, but we will be, and we'll have a good chat in that limelight. First of all, to introduce myself. I mentioned some of us have been around Toastmasters for quite some time. Uh, I started something like 25 years ago, a very, very long time ago. And I'm the Public Relations Officer for District 73 in Toastmasters. And that means I look after our marketing, particularly from a public information standpoint, across the three states of Australia, South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania. I work in a number of large corporate environments and also in my own business and have learned quite a bit around how leadership is performed in all of those environments. One of the things I've particularly been working on is global IT delivery. How do we engage with people around the world and produce project teams that deliver projects or services in a global context? So that's been a fascinating place to learn about leadership. I've also been very involved in in small business growth and strategies, well, business growth strategies, how people grow, how to market, and also how to speak persuasively, particularly when you're trying to sell in those environments. Our panellists come from all over the world, like, like we saw before. And our next panellist is Naomi. And you'll see Naomi, she's in red on the slide, but she's in green in person. Now, Naomi Takeuchi joined Toastmasters in around 2005, about 10 years ago. And she's achieved one of these buzzwords, a, a DTM, a Distinguished Toastmaster. And she can probably tell us a little bit more about that in a moment. But she's also been a past district governor, so she's looked after one of our districts in Toastmasters, and there are around about 99 districts in Toastmasters, so quite experienced in that space. And she's also working towards an accredited speaker status, which means that she has reached a professional level of accreditation with Toastmasters International. She's held some executive positions in telecommunications and biotech industries, and she's also an independent leadership development practitioner in the United States. Now, Naomi, I said I'd get somebody to talk about what a DTM is. What, what is a DTM, and what's that meant to you around leadership? Well, thank you, Ian. Hello, everyone. As far as a DTM stands for Distinguished Toastmaster, and what that involves is two different tracks. There is a speaking track and a leadership track. And a speaking track essentially is about 40 speeches that you give on a variety of topics. And they could be from persuasive speaking, as Ian had mentioned earlier, or speaking on television. There are quite a few advanced projects that are available through Toastmasters. What I love about the program is that you can customize it to what fits your needs. As far as the other track is the leadership track, and the leadership track includes not only being an officer at a club, but also holding bigger leadership roles within what they call the area, division, and the district levels. And I don't want to belabor that, but I just wanted to mention there are two tracks. Uh, people can take their time. It's self-paced. My first DTM took about three and a half years. I know people who have taken 
anywhere from three years to even 20 years to complete their DTM. It really is a self-paced program, whatever suits your needs. Excellent. Thank you very much, Naomi. You're welcome. Our next speaker that's joined us this morning, tonight, today, is Jackie Bailey. And Jackie is going to get an impromptu question as well very shortly, so hopefully we can hear her in just a moment. She joined Toastmasters in about 2009, so one of the, one of the newer kids on the block today. She's also achieved, achieved a DTM, and she's also one of those people who have been a past district governor. And we might have a chat, Jack, Jackie, about what that means shortly. What does it mean to be a district governor in Toastmasters from a leadership perspective? She's also an independent leadership coach, consultant, speaker, blogger, and author, and works quite extensively around team development and something she calls self-centered leadership. Jackie, would you like to fill us in on what a PDG does in Toastmasters and what that means from a leadership perspective? Yes, hello everyone and thanks for uh, letting me be involved today. A district is a geographical boundary, if you will, of certain numbers of Toastmasters clubs. It also involves areas and divisions within a district. And a district is run by a district governor and two lieutenant governors, one whose responsibility is to add additional clubs to the district, and the other is responsible for education and training of officers and other members of the district. So past district governor means that I have served in leadership positions as those lieutenant governors, as well as a district governor. And there are some responsibilities beyond that as well as a path of district governor there you continue to support the district and help with uh, new elections for officers and you head up some committees as well. Doing four years of leadership in that regard is like running a small corporation and there were probably about 100 leaders that I oversaw in that district officer position for those four years. So it was an amazing opportunity to learn true leadership. Terrific, Jackie. That's great. And yes, all of our districts around the world have around about 100 to 150 clubs that are all operating discreetly. And the district is really supporting those 100 clubs, let's say, with 20 members each, all developing speakers and leaders through the Toastmasters program. So a lot of experience in the room having done activities like that. Our third panelist today is Greg, Greg Gazim from Canada. Now he's another one of the old timers around the room, joined Toastmasters around about 15, 14 years ago. Also a distinguished Toastmaster, also a past district governor in his, in his uh, region and also has received a presidential citation, which is an interesting little beast where our international president recognises people who have made a big impact to the Toastmasters organisation. He's clearly very involved around technology, technology columnist, columnist, speaker, blogger, podcaster and author. And I'm going to let Greg stew a little bit before I put his question to him. But Greg, just in one sentence or six, what is technology doing to Toastmasters into leadership. Just two minutes on that, please. Two minutes or six lines? <laughs> I think, first of all, Toastmasters is bringing the world together. I mean, just think about it. What we're doing here today is absolutely incredible, something that couldn't be achieved before. On a more simpler level, with the advent of something like email or even using video, things like YouTube, you can now put what you're doing out there. It's helping with a lot of the training, it's also bringing the training into the home. So ideally, while you still want to have face-to-face -face communication, and I love face-to-face -face, even though I'm a gadget guy, I still think that there's an opportunity for people to learn at their own pace and also in their own place. So for example, if you, there's proper training that can be done, there's some videos, it can be done at 2 o'clock in the morning local time. Excellent. Great insight. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. And that brings us to Carol, who's pretty well known in the Aussie Live world. She joined Toastmasters in 2002. I'm not game to call Carol an old timer. She's also in Australia in the, on the border between Victoria and New South Wales. So she actually spans two districts as well. So that's a bit of a challenge having, having 
at least two masters and many, many more, and has also been an immediate past area governor. So she's, she's done a lot of the, the journeys that uh, others of us around the table had. And Carol, my question to you is, how does leadership play out at an area level in Toastmasters? Oh, that's a good question. Thanks, Ian. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be with you on the panel podium today. And I'll try to look into my camera this time to make sure that you can all see me properly. I enjoyed my year as an area governor. But one of the things we find is that it's not always a smooth journey depending on where you are located. For me, I'm in the regional area of Victoria and New South Wales and our clubs span around about 300 kilometres between each of them. So a lot of my job was on the road and visiting clubs, sometimes travelling down the dusty roads looking out for kangaroos on the way home in the evening. So I always advise area governors in regional areas to gird their loins and fill up their petrol tanks because you've got a lot of travelling to do. Thanks, Ian. Very good, Carol. Thanks for that intro. And yes, country, uh, Victoria, South Wales, Western Australia, South Australia have their critters. They've all got their critters you've got to look out for and I've grown up in a couple of those areas so I know what it's like. Moving on to our discussion around leadership. Now, I mentioned before at the, the top of the meeting and also as we've gone through this, this introduction that there are numerous facets of, of what leadership is and I'd like to see if we can get some level of audience interaction and also some interaction more from our panellists around the question of what act leadership actually is and we'd all have a view I'm sure. Now you'll all see that you do have some lovely icons next to your control panel where you could type in on that page right now what leadership means to you. Or you can also type into the chat box and we'll see it there. And just, just let's do a quick brainstorm, just for a minute, of what leadership means to us. I'm just going to try and type one now and see if I can say that. That leadership is getting a strategy and leading a team to achieve it. Somebody's also written its influence. And I can't quite see who writes things there, Carol, but that's fine. Any of our panellists like to have a quick word on what they think leadership really is? Yes, Greg. Don't forget to type, uh, click your talk button, Greg. Thank you. I have the mute button on. There's a many, there are many definitions of leadership. In fact, the Toastmasters International President had asked that to a group when he visited our fair city not that long ago, and he asked us to yell out what leadership was. And I don't think there was one. There, I don't think there were two people that actually had the same response. But I think that leadership is the ability to inspire and influence others to achieve some sort of worthwhile or worthy result, in a nutshell. Very good. I like Naomi's quote there. When you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. Where does that come from, Naomi? I'm not sure exactly where I heard that from, but it stuck with me because if you just think about dogs when they work together, they're in packs. And the lead dog always has an interesting view, and if you're not the lead dog, your view is always the same. And I think what I like about this quote is that it's humorous, but it also puts the point forward that the leader has to find the direction of where they want to go, and they also need to show and lead the others behind them. And so being the lead dog, you're the one who's setting the direction, finding where you want to go, having the vision, and being able to take people there. Excellent. I see someone's put up there the ability to inspire and influence others to achieve worthwhile results. So true. Jackie, do you have a comment on leadership and what it is? 
Yeah, leadership to me is influence. That's, that's how that got on the screen there. And I think that in that sense, we all are leaders. Because whether we influence for good or bad, people are watching us. People are taking note of the actions that we perform. And our attitude helps them know if we're happy or unhappy with what we're doing. So our influence is key in leading. And, and I believe it's actually the first trait that we're born with. And it's something that as we enhance throughout our lives, we can change lives through our very influence. Absolutely, and well said. Influence is is the way to communicate what you're uh, looking to achieve as a team. And without that, no one's going to know what you're even up to to follow or to produce the outcome you're after. Carol, do you have a view on leadership and what it is? I can certainly do that for you. I was mucking around on the whiteboard here doing my Please. leadership role. <laughs> uh, for me, I think it's taking care of other people before yourself, making sure that their journey is uh, achievable, or their goals are achievable, and you're often doing that through unknown territory and leading others, and they need to have faith that you're leading them into an area where they can succeed. So one has to be not only a leader, but also has to be um, believable and uh, trustworthy. Absolutely. And they are very diverse skills. Just listening to those responses, while it sounds like it's, it's, it's really just about leading and influencing, the challenge, I think, is that there are many drivers that can affect that course of, of action. And really, sometimes a leader has to be aware of so much to achieve even that single purpose. And that's what strikes me about training leaders, is that we can talk a lot about the skills that you need to adopt. And there's, there's really two ways of looking at it, I think. It's, it's what are the basic skills that you want to, to, to instill in people so that they can be leaders. But one of the biggest things that helps us succeed as a leader is that of resilience. If we can be more resilient than normal, then we'll become a better leader. And I think that resilience needs to step up to certain challenges. And I wonder what we would find if we were to look at training leaders around what the barriers really are to effective leadership. Now, there are numerous barriers to being an effective leader. Um, one might be having a dog in front of you, perhaps, it's with some of those definitions before. But what do we think around the room might be barriers, either in the chat box or, or somebody may want to wish, wish to make a comment. Perhaps, Naomi, I know you've been thinking about barriers to effective leadership. What's a barrier to effective leadership to you? Well, thank you, Ian. I think one of the things that, especially right now, people are very nervous about making mistakes. And one of the people that I really admire is James Dyson. I, for those of you who are familiar with the Dyson vacuum cleaners, the Dyson hand dryers, what he espouses is that when you are building leaders, you should have the ability to make mistakes and learn from them. And unfortunately, I think one of the barriers right now is that people are too nervous and too worried about making mistakes. And I think if more of our culture allows for that within a corporate environment, then I think that we would have that ability to create um, leaders who are going to be willing to make those mistakes and to push the envelope and look at things differently. That's true. The, the risk of failing is probably ha perhaps people's biggest fear. Forget that old one around public speaking. Forget the one around, uh, around death. It's probably the risk of, of things just going wrong and, and not being able to do it whatever it is. But the interesting one I think um, might have been Carol put up, the lack of access to professional development as an individual. Was that you, Carol? <laughs> yes, that's me. You guessed it. I'm fiddling around on the whiteboard again. Uh, yes, I think that for some people who may well be really effective leaders, if they lack the access to their own professional development as an individual, it might take them longer to achieve their leadership goals. 
So I think that for all educators, we all need to be allowed some time, possibly money as well, to be part of a leadership program. I certainly benefited from mine in 2002 when I did my Flexible Learning Leaders program and that's when I joined Toastmasters. Very good. And Greg, I can see you all champing a bit and I'm, I'm interested to see what you think of the, one of the biggest barriers to effective leadership. I think one of the barriers might be, and I'm actually, I was thinking about Robin Sharma and he wrote a book, Leader with No Title. And I think, and I, that was the first thing that came to mind when you asked the question. I think what happens is that people with the jobs that they do, they might be, they might be a clerk in a bookstore or they might be a janitor at, at a location and they might feel that they're a worker and not a leader, not realizing that they have an opportunity to take leadership, take responsibility with what they do and make a difference to, to individuals. So they might think that, well, I'm not a leader because it's not in the cards for me. The other Chris, side, please. sorry? Yeah. Keep going. Yep. Uh, the other side might be is that for me, for example, I spent most of my life behind the keyboard and of course I, I'm very grateful for Toastmasters for helping transform me. So I would, years ago, I would probably have preferred to sit behind the keyboard rather than actually get up and speak in front of people. And so leadership in the, in the pure sense is something that I thought was never on my radar, again, until I was introduced to Toastmasters where I took on leadership roles within the, within the club and then, of course, at the, at the district level. So, so there's, there's really two sides to that. One, some people don't think that what they do is important for a leadership role. And then the second one, for some people, they may figure that it's something that's never on their radar. Having taken on the district governor position, one of our just past district governors says that's akin to taking on the CEO of, at the time, a organization that of 250 branches, 275 branches, and 6,000 members. So sometimes people don't realize that it's something that could effectively be on their radar. Absolutely. And Jackie, do you have a, a thought on what barriers to effective leadership have been for you personally, or for those you know in your world? Well, I see barriers to effective leadership all the time as I work with businesses. Most of it is because the leader him or herself don't see their responsibilities as a leader and they lack the, the foundation of a vision and providing expectations to those that they are leading. And I see many times leaders want to focus on gaining more followers instead of actually helping to develop leaders from the people who they're leading and that is a great barrier to being effective in your in your leadership role. Mm. Very very interesting aspects and perspectives. Some of the things I've been thinking about as being extra barriers to that is that I think we have a, a propensity as, as perhaps as humans to be right and when we want to be right I think that presupposes, especially for me being a mathematician at heart, but I'm weird, right? I've got a six-year-old kid and I've told him how to, how to count to ten in dad's special way. And so he starts one, two, three, pi, four, five, six. Okay, I'm a nerd. I probably have a few things in common with you, Greg, there. But that sense of being right is, is so mathematical. But as a leader, there isn't usually just one answer. Usually there are multiple answers. And one of the challenges to, to leadership I find is that the people are searching for that one answer and not equipped to deal with the divergent answers that are possible. Um, leadership is, is still not a mathematical style science. It is actually an art of choosing strategies which are quite open. In a world where while you're trying to move in one direction, there's a thousand things coming in the other that are there to, to pull you down. I'm just being told that March 14th is Pi Day. Yes, it is, Greg, and uh, we both know it. But with all those, those, those other information things coming at us, 
and Greg's a great example of this, there is information coming to a leader all the time. And I think one of the, the barriers to effective leadership is making sense from all of those signals coming in. There's a huge volume of information. There's a, some of it's relevant, some of it's not. And I think one trait of a leader is to be able to seek out the right information quickly, um, much quicker than, than they used to five or even or ten or even five years ago, but also to, to find it when you need it, like now, and also to be able to, to store the information that you do find in an effective way. Um, the volume of information, the places we can go, the websites we can use, the tools that we can use are just exploding. The options, mind-blowing. But we need to get more succinct, clear the decks, if you like, and, and get very clear thinking about our leadership. We talk about people working in business as two, two different sorts. People working in the business and people working on the business. And when you have that contrast, you start to realise that being in the business with all the busyness doesn't give you the space to sit back, take stock and work out that vision and effect that plan. And so I think there's a, a huge opportunity there for leadership education to help people know how to sift great information from just noise because there's a ton of noise there. In fact, I was, I was talking to my Toastmasters club just uh, a week ago and there was a workshop on audience engagement and I made the point with one of the audience attendees that when you're presenting, and this isn't normal in a, isn't normal in a, a, a normal speaking environment, but once you're in a business context where we're speaking for now like we are now, people actually have their mobile phones and they're scanning down through their Facebook feeds, that is where their information is coming from. And you as a speaker need to overcome all that noise and make your vision really clear. So fascinating stuff about the barriers to leadership. Carol, what's your thoughts on the barriers to leadership? I don't think we've touched you yet. <laughs> oh, I've been listening intently to everyone, but one of the things that uh, I think you'll find uh, would lead to a barrier would be attitude or, or perhaps a poor attitude. And for some people, they are always going to be the glass half full rather than, no, they're always going to be the glass half empty rather than the glass half full type of personality. And that is a barrier to them stepping up to be a visionary leader. They may do their bit in other ways, but in, unless you have the charisma and the positivity, then your leadership style will fall flat. So I think in order to be a visionary leader, you certainly need attitude. Definitely. Now, I'm just checking that we've covered most of our panellists on that one. Just put a message in if you've got something to add or put your hand up, guys. But one of the things that I think comes out of that discussion about barriers is that there is a set of skills that people need to acquire. Now, I've sort of skimmed over my enemy's comment there a little bit around mentors because some skills are internal, some skills are available from outside. And I'd love to get Naomi's take on the position of mentors in leadership because really, if I just flick to the next page for a moment, they are one of our sources and skills that we can use as a leader. So Naomi, tell us a bit more about the role of mentoring to a leader for you. I really appreciate the time to talk about mentors because one of the things that I think many of us feel that we need to do things on our own, that we can accomplish these things on our own. And one thing that I love about Toastmasters is that they have an entire mentorship program that they have not only at the club level but also as part of leadership. And I know that both myself and Jackie and actually also Greg have all been past district governors. And part of that mentorship comes from the other leaders that we serve with. It's something called the TRIO where we have the district governor, the lieutenant governor of education and training, and the lieutenant governor of marketing. And what's nice is that you have some models to follow as you're working through the ranks. 
And one thing that I found, especially being an entrepreneur, is that if you don't have those models and mentors available to you, then in some ways you're leading somewhat blind. And one thing that I've worked really, really hard on is to get mentors in my life who can help me in different industries, especially when it's an industry I'm perhaps going into that I'm not as familiar with. And I think that uh, looking back, I wish I had thought about mentorship uh, earlier on. And I think for the 21st century, uh, mentors are going to be critical. Absolutely, man. man. I mean, thank you for that insight. And I love the way you mentioned the mentors in different industries. Because I think when people ask the question, do you have a mentor? When you, when you go to answer it, you're thinking of just one. When in fact, we should be modeling ourselves on a number of people perhaps from different industries in your example, but perhaps also who is someone we admire in our personal life? Who is someone we admire in business? Who is someone we admire for their leadership activities? And perhaps you know, we say leaders are readers, but in a way if you want to read those role models, <clears throat> understand what they're doing <clears throat> pardon me, effectively and take the best of that and bottle it and build an amalgam in yourself of those people who are your mentors. And the second aspect strikes me, I'd be interested to see what Jackie thinks of, of this one with her background as well, and that is that, as a, especially in small business, one of the things that, that we find there is that they're actually quite a lonely set of people. They've, they've been the tradies who have become the business owner, and they feel a bit lonely when they find that, hey, I don't have other employees around me perhaps to, to paddle with me. But what they really need is a board of advisors around them who are, who are like mentors, who could be the, the accountants, the financial planner, they could be their, their business coach, they could be a range of roles that they look up to as a mentor. Jackie, what have you found around mentoring in your dealings with, with people in your role in the world? Ian, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think that business owners tend to feel that they can be successful because of the skills that they've learned in college or, or the skills that they've gained to the point where they've opened their own business. And that might be true, but it's not necessarily the, the hard skills that they need. It's more of the softer skills of leadership. It's being able to communicate clearly with people, with customers, with clients, with their employees, and without having someone that keeps them accountable and who they can, they can uh, share ideas with or create and develop new technologies with, then things become stagnant and their employees aren't engaged and people don't feel ownership, they don't take ownership in the business any longer. So leadership means having mentors around you, even if you own your own business. It is important to have some people around you that not only will help you with those difficult things, those business-related skills, but someone who can also help you with some of those soft skills and mentor you, coach you, and hold you, hold you accountable to ways that you're treating people and communicating with your, your clients and, and customers as well. Great stuff, Jackie. Great and, stuff. Uh, that's some really good stuff there. And I know Carol's put a comment on the chat box, which sort of on the, the whiteboard, which sort of bridges from that into the technology world. And Carol, I can see you're talking about digitally extraordinary there. Can you explain a little bit about what that means? I, I believe that was in a session yesterday. <laughs> yes, indeed. I have borrowed that expression because it really resonated for me. Our keynote presenter last night was talking about schools being known as digitally extraordinary and how to build a digitally extraordinary school and how that takes leadership. So it fits right into our discussion here. I believe that there's a number of e-skills that we need to have in order to be digitally extraordinary and we're exhibiting them today in this webinar. We need to know how to speak to an audience online. We need to know how to get into a webinar room or any kind of video conferencing because that's the way of the world. In Ben Newsom's uh, presentation so long ago, I think it was Friday, 
the video conferencing really came through very, very clearly as something that is going to move us along sharply. And as Toastmasters, we need not to be afraid of the technology, but to embrace it. So yes, Naomi, I agree. Don't be afraid. Step up. Make use of that microphone as a first step. Then go online and maybe send your words across the world. Excellent, Carol. That's a, a fascinating insight. And the Digitally Extraordinary discussion last night was very much around a school that really was a showcase environment with uh, a bunch of technology organisations supporting a school to be perhaps they would they would they would hope to be the exemplar in terms of school use of technology. And Naomi reminded me that uh, just recently, well, I, actually in August, August last year, that's recent, six months ago, we had a Toastmasters International Convention, and we have one of those every year. They've mostly been in the US, but last year it was in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And uh, a number of many, many Toastmasters managed to get to Kuala Lumpur and show support for a, for a convention outside the United States. And because of my circumstances at the time, I chose to stay at home and managed to be one of the, tw the, the tweets. Almost sounds bad calling yourself a tweet, uh, a, a Twitterer reporting the results of that particular event. And it was actually through that process that Naomi and I met, virtually met as, as tweets together. But the interesting thing about Digitally Extraordinary and that story is that here we were with a, a real in-person audience with several thousand, I think it was about 5,000 people were in attendance. And we had a room of about 10 of us who were watching via video so webcams into our homes, and then those 10 of us were sharing our own uh, feedback on what these speeches were like. The two or three, maybe four of us, were tweeting out results uh, around the world. So that members who were not at that actual event were receiving the results of the event actually quicker than any official results could have achieved. And it, it really worked well as a, a lot of recognition for, for that communication. And it really was just integrating a real world experience, such as would happen in a classroom or in this, this discussion right now, or a 5,000 person event, and bringing technology to, to bear to bring everyone closer together. And it was extremely powerful and uh, perhaps was the best, best ever uh, experience of tying them together. And Greg, I'm sure you've seen some great ways that technology can be used to build leadership. And what technology do our future leaders need to come to grips with to be effective leaders? I think in general, if I want to generalize, and instead of just picking on a particular application or a particular product, I think in general what leaders need to be able to do is they need to be able to take whatever technology that they're learning or whatever technology is available and learn how to apply it. What seems to happen in general is that they have a, an opportunity or they'll, they'll need to do some presentations or they'll need to do some training. And at the last second or the last minute, they'll just get right into it and say, okay, how do I do this? And they'll use the technology as maybe an afterthought rather than using the technology as a way to, to better communicate or to help effectively move, uh, move individuals forward. I also think that to also, to just to go back to your original question, you're saying what skills our future leaders need. I think that as, as we move forward, we're finding like right now a lot, of the, the, a lot of the millennials are using a lot of technology. But we also realize that they need to help learn, as I think Carol said, to improve their, their communication skills, their, leadership, their listening skills, and their leadership skills. And I think where, where you could have the, the two coming together is that the population is aging. We've got lots of baby boomers out there that are reaching retirement age. Some are tech savvy, some are not tech savvy. And I think there's an opportunity that you have those that are, that have the experience that can work with those that don't. So let's just say the millennials have a lot more technology experience. Those that are, have been around for a while have that real live world business experience. Why not get them together and, and help each other? Definitely. Great point. So I actually see Ben commenting in the whiteboard. Ben, would you like to turn your microphone on and just tell us a little bit more about that that you've written? 
sure, but you might get some toddlers <laughs> in the background. Um, no, I was just really writing like this. The smallest connections can happen. I mean, we've been running for 10 years, and the uh, smallest of tweets from someone or something we've done, in, passing someone in the hallway just talking about things, all of a sudden sends us new directions. That's, uh, that's all I was getting at. Yeah, you're right. It's those little, those little snippets. And one of the things I've done in my um, activities over the last five years or so has been to realise that we learn differently as a leader, particularly as an entrepreneur. Um, one, of the, one of the things I was told by a, a mentor of mine once was, uh, no offence, guys, but he came from America and he came to Australia. And in Australia, it's not quite as competitive as the US market yet. But he said, you've got to do your first MBA, and once you've done that, you've got to do your second. Now, Masters of Business Administration is a lot of work, and one of the things I think a lot of us are a little bit work averse, and especially in Australia, um, Rima would have it. But uh, one of the things I realised is that our entrepreneurs do not learn now through MBAs. They actually learn through what I call rules of thumb. There are very, very um, direct messages that get into an entrepreneur's brain and it changes their rule set for their, their business. For example, um, pay yourself first. That could be a rule for a business owner that changes the way they tackle outgoing payments. And they're those sorts of messages that entrepreneurs learn from. It's not sitting down in the classroom for an hour a week or a month. It's actually little snippets like that that they've heard that, that resonate for them, that produce a solution for them that drives them forward. Just an interesting uh, uh, shift in the way our leaders are learning today. I don't think we've heard from uh, Jackie for a moment on this topic. Jackie, are you there still? I'm here. So what do you what think would you like to say? Your needs? I didn't hear the question. What are the skills that you think a future leader needs? Mentoring was one. Is there another? Well, I think that leaders need to empower their lives by making choices that do just that. I think that there are going to be struggles in life as a leader. In my experience has been the moment I have decided to take on a new leadership opportunity. It seems like the planets align to create situations that will challenge me and make me rethink my goals and my plans. And so I, I believe that future leaders need to be in a position where they have empowered their lives with great choices. And when those challenges come, they know how to handle it. They know how to overcome those tough times and continue to lead with service and with love and, ma and making friends along the way. I think that's really important for the future. It definitely is. I think we all too often forget the nurturing side of leadership. It can be pretty um, lonely, we mentioned before, for the, the small entrepreneur, the solopreneur, but for the large corporate guy, there's a fair chance that they're not getting the love either through the, the need to progress and the need to produce bottom line results that drives them so hard. But when we have all these skills, one of the things that a, not a leader needs to do is to convert all those skills and those divergent results or divergent answers that are out there into something that actually drives us forward. Sometimes they're incubator labs that can lead us forward, as Naomi just mentioned, but often they are, they are focused initiatives that drive the organisation forward. It could be a culture change program, it could be a, a program to in, improve results, it could be a, an outsourcing opportunity is one of the many things I've been involved in over and over again, in fact. Those strategic uh, choices become projects that need to succeed. And one of the things I think that uh, is really valuable is learning how to apply those leadership skills into a structured format to, to be sure of producing results. It's one thing to get them by chance, but, but we all need to develop ways to create the results by design. Now, I know Toastmasters has a number of vehicles for developing those leadership skills. We've talked about some of them already around being a, a governor of district area, um, governor that leads parts of Toastmasters.
as markers forward. But we've also mentioned we've got a couple of people in the room who have achieved their DTM, and I've been on my way for a very long time and just haven't got there yet. But one of the things we do in Toastmasters is around high-performance leadership. Greg, you might like to tell us first this time. What was your high-performance leadership project in Toastmasters, and, and what did that teach you about taking a vision from idea to reality? Greg? <laughs> I've actually done about six or seven of them, actually. <laughs> I've done quite a few. I think one that maybe I could pick up on was probably my would be my first one, and that was back in late 2006, 2007. And I decided to use the technical skills that I had to do a high performance leadership project by creating a podcast for Toastmasters. My concept was that we speak in Toastmasters, and at that point there was there there really wasn't that much online. Podcasting is probably just in its infancy stage. And so I thought, well, here's an opportunity to be able to hear, to listen through audio. And so my, my team comprised of a few of my fellow Toastmasters, plus our district governor at the time. And in fact, the first podcast, which is only supposed to be one podcast, now I've got over 50 of them, was actually talking to our, our district governor. And the process that I went through, I think, as an entrepreneur, you're sometimes you just roll your sleeves up and you just get in there and you just do something. And what you don't realize is that there is a process by having a mission, your vision, your values, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that the Toastmasters program has that high-performance leadership that actually allowed me to go through that process. And it's interesting because... The old way of doing things, or the old way that I used to do things, again, you know, you throw stuff at the fan and see what sticks, just didn't work. And by forcing me to systematically go through that program helped me learn a lot. And in fact, after that, I was able to use that working with uh, some startups, working with some community associations, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So the High Performance Leadership Project really helped me. And in fact, that podcast just has gone crazy. We just surpassed 750,000 hits, and now I'm really grateful. I'm, I'm now one of the co-hosts of the Toastmasters International Podcast. Excellent, and well done on that initiative. And that's Thank a really you. good example where you, you pull things together to produce the result. I just say 800,000 times if you, if you count those hits as results, which you would. And Jackie, one of the things that uh, you would, would experience is is seeing the small business world and even yourself producing results like that too. What has Toastmasters added for you in your skill set to be able to achieve those results? Oh my goodness, um, so many things. When I joined Toastmasters, it was because I was starting my own business and I realized that I needed to be more confident in my communication with potential clients. And so Toastmasters to me have the goal of helping me to just gain more confidence in my message, to be able to network more fully and effectively. And I got way more than I bargained for because I didn't realize that Toastmasters has such a focus on leadership. And for me, the opportunity to to mentor individuals, the opportunity to overcome my fears of getting up and speaking, the opportunity to create a message that I felt was important for the world to hear, and then practice that message, getting feedback on that message in my leadership ability has really helped me to be able to talk to clients, talk to doctors and business owners, and individuals who are have much greater education than I do, but I can I can connect with them on a different level than I used to be able to because of the confidence that I gained and the and the just little practice sessions I've had in each meeting I've attended the Toastmasters Club. Yes. It's it's just something that it's hard it's hard to define until you experience it. Yeah, and it sounds like you've gained a lot from all of those angles. And I think that's the experience of most people. It's a bit like a TARDIS. It's only small on the, on the outside. Once you get inside, there's a whole lot there. Naomi, what do you think Toastmasters offers in leadership skills? And also, just to signal a little bit, what do you think all educators should be doing to develop leadership skills? 
Well, first of all, I, I do want to reiterate a lot of what Jackie had mentioned is that Toastmasters has so many levels that you can build your skills as far as uh, being in leadership and being able to create your vision and being able to lead a group of people, whether it's a small club to an area to a district. It's, it's amazing the opportunities that it gives you. As far as developing leadership skills, I think the number one thing that we have to be able to do is adapt to change. And I remember I was sending this email to Ian about how we have this society that changes so quickly. That's not to say that we're not going to change things that are tried and true. And I told him I would show you this. Since you're all in Australia, Vegemite is not going to change. It's going to be the same. <laughs> but of course, we have to adapt to the changing world, especially in the way we communicate. So I think it goes back to what I had mentioned earlier about being able to accept change on a daily basis and then also being able to accept failure and being able to take risks. And by doing that, you'll have a chance to develop leaders who are resilient and can adapt to change and then take us into the future. Excellent. And Carol, you've been doing some stuff too around educating our leaders within Toastmasters. What do you think the biggest skill is we need to get out there? to the whole leadership community, not just in Toastmasters as a whole? All right, that's a much bigger question. Um, thank you, Ian, and I'll try to do it really quickly. I think for developing educators uh, and allowing them to develop their leadership skills, I'm a big advocate for having um, mentored programs so that they can learn as a group and build their skills across a wide variety with the time to do it and to think about it. So Ben uh, Newsom, who is with us today, he was on a Churchill Fellowship scholarship last year, and that allowed him to travel and to, to see what others are doing. In my year as a flexible learning leader in 2002, I also was enabled to travel, and I could then look for the similarities and the differences of the ways in which educators are leading. So I would be saying, for everyone to look at the ways in which you can put forward a leadership program for individuals. Terrific. Thank you very much for that, Carol. I'm just noticing my other comments on the screen about uh, that students are a lot more um, aware these days and therefore you can't assume, you can't take that knowledge and ignore it. It's all there and you need to build on it all the time. Now, we'd just like to thank you our panel that's been with us today. You'll see all of us there, Jackie, Ian, myself, Naomi, Greg and Carol. You can see ways to contact us there, particularly via Twitter. After all, there are a, a set of tweets here really. And we'd love to have any, any questions and answers or even comments back to those Twitter handles and we'd happily talk more about 21st century leaders. Back to you, Carol. Thank you so much, Ian. I want to give you a real applause this time so you can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> like we do in our online Toastmaster meetings. You, you can see here the power of the voice, of voices, from experienced leaders. And we've been able to learn a new skill on the fly and build our Lego blocks of information on our whiteboards. What a great idea that you had and it's carried through very, very well. And I'm really, really happy to have met Jackie and Greg and Naomi up on the podium with me. Uh, who did I forget? No one. And having a couple in the audience was really a bonus. But this will make a really great recording that people can look back on for our think tank about 21st centuries. So once again, Ian, thank you. You can give Ian the applause in the Blackboard Collaborate way using the, the applause button. Definitely we'll be catching up online. And at this point, I will close the recording. Excellent, guys. Thank you.